I made it. Yes, rabbit, rabbit tomorrow. If you know, you know. Whoops, we've got to fix my camera. Right, there we go. Got to get the MFIA in there. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. All right. Everybody wants to learn about uh, due diligence. Is that what I'm supposed to be teaching on tonight? All right. Not a problem. I can do that. Um, in the process of it right now, and I'll uh, tell you about the deal that we're about to get on the contract that actually I should, um, um, I tell you what, as we're, as we're sitting here talking, I'll actually send an email to the, uh, broker. Uh, of course your name doesn't pop up. Um, here we go. Um, update. Wendy, just checking in on the uh, status of the draft for the PNS. Uh, thanks, Gerald Dobbins. Okay, so while we're doing this, watch how much you want to bet when we, uh, when I, um, before the end of this call. Uh, I will actually get a, um, I'll actually get a, a, a test. Um, I'll actually get a response back to us so we can find out where we stand with the due diligence on a deal that we have going on that we can accept an LOI on right now. Um, hey, Al, I didn't, Al, if you sent me any emails or anything, I, I did not receive them. Um, nothing came in this week. I would be looking for them. Uh, if you need my email, I think they'll get, type that in there. Hello, John. Hello, hello, hello. Um, all right. So here we go. Due diligence. Most fun. So obviously, you know, you go through the the um, the process where you're looking for the deals and you find a deal, you make an offer, you go back and forth with the seller and the broker to, to you know, find the terms that work best for you and you get an accepted offer. Ooh, Nelly. Okay. Then what happens is you go back and forth once again on the purchase and sale contract. You draft your side, they draft yours, finally come down to a final version. And then you execute it. And when you execute it, depending upon how the contract is written, the clock starts ticking. The clock will start ticking multiple times through most contracts, uh, depending upon you know the title work, depending upon the due diligence, the financing. Um, you know when the uh, you know the, the the effective date and the execution date in my contracts are two different dates because we get two different clocks running, uh, but. Throughout that whole process within the purchase and sale is a is a an inspection period that everybody can call as a due diligence period. And that is true, but that's not the only due diligence you've got to do at this early stage. You actually have three phases of due diligence, but they don't teach you this. They Teach it as like the physical inspection, the property inspection. You got to go hire an inspector. You got to jump in your car or get on a plane and fly to the property and have your your due diligence team go out there and inspect the property. Okay, that's all fine and good. The fact of the matter is that that's the last part of the due diligence due diligence process that you should be involved in. Uh, the physical inspection comes last. So let's say, for instance, that you have negotiated the contract and it's a 30-day inspection period. Okay, what do you do? You keep your ass in the seat. You don't go anywhere. You do two previous stages of due diligence before you start the physical due diligence. I know everybody's like, what, 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 what? And um, I'm, I, I said, where's my name? I had my name. I typed my name in there because I I got a great um, I got a great uh, um, ah, I lost it. I got a great um, uh, compliment from a client the other day. Um, and let me just see if I can find it again. I had it all ready to go until I typed in that broker's uh, broker's name. Let's see uh, right here. Let's see if this is it. 
Oh, of course, the operation failed. I love that. But he called me a business disruptor, and I loved it. I thought, what a great compliment. I, uh, you know, with my H two A and my my uh, um, syndication is a, not syndication, but passive investing is a scam. Um, and and I, I was actually on a podcast the other day, and this woman's all about passive investing. I said, do you know how I feel about passive investing? And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just come on anyway. So I did, and we had a nice time. We we didn't go get it at each other's throats. I was ready for it, but she was she was such a nice lady. I didn't want to uh, be a disruptor, so uh, I I stayed clear of that. Um, yeah, beware to check the elevator gurney. Yeah, exactly. First floor equity. Yeah, we know who you are. Hello, John Paskowski. Good to see you. Hey, John. Listen. Uh, I just want to make sure, John, you are ready for the four o'clock session um, of this, of what you signed up for. Uh, I know you're in the next cohort, but I want you to see what happens in a cohort. So uh, uh, you can um, be there. If you are if um, you haven't received an invite or anything, I'll have Molly or, or Deb send you over something between now and four o'clock and you can, um, you can chime in then. You'll enjoy that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the first two phases, and all of this is spelled out in the purchase and sale contract, and I want everybody to understand that, and we're probably going to talk purchase and sale contracts in future classes, uh, just because part of the, uh, okay, hey, uh, Molly and Deb, can you send uh, John an invite for uh, the four o'clock? Okay, so uh, within the purchase and sale contract, we talk about the legal, the financial, and the physical inspection. So those are the three levels of due diligence, and they're all spelled out in the purchase and sale. And you've got to make sure that the property and the deal passes all three levels or you're not going to leave your seat. All right. So what happens is as soon as the clock starts ticking, you, you're going to deal with the legal due diligence. Now, the legal due diligence is that title inspection period that typically runs for the 30 days of your physical due diligence, all right? It's got its own time frames and certain days that you have to do certain things, but they tend to be a 30-day window um, as most contracts are drafted. And those those 30 days will typically match up with your, your physical due diligence, which should be 30 days, depending upon the size of the property, where it's located, what have you. So that, that um, legal due diligence ties right in to the physical due diligence, but you have to get this started right away. So what will happen is you're going to receive a letter in the mail from a title insurance company. All right. And in that title insurance company is a title commitment letter. Now, understand the difference. And this is kind of a nuance, but I want everybody to understand this. There's the title, the title agent and the title insurance company. Sometimes they can be the same thing, but not usually. Like in Massachusetts here, lawyers close title. In other parts of the country, you have title agencies that you use when you have when you want to set up uh, close title, set up escrow. They go out and they pr procure a title insurance policy for you from a title insurance company. All right. So in that, and that's the real key is you want to make sure that you get to choose the title insurance company because that's the one insuring your risk. You don't want, I mean, I, I got in fights with brokers over me wanting to choose the, the company. So we don't do that here in Texas. The, the seller chooses the company. What is the seller care? He's going to be under a palm tree in the Bahamas when I have to file the claim. He's going to be long gone. So I want to choose the company that I have faith in. And the reason why I do it that way is because the first time I ever purchased a title insurance policy for one of my properties, three years later, I had to put in a claim because the closing agent screwed up on the taxes and they screwed up on the taxes and we ended up owing $17,000 of additional money because they screwed up. It's an insurance claim. We go file, in it, file a claim with the title company. Guess what? 
they went out of business. I had to go deal with the with a uh, insurance commissioner for the state of Michigan to get my seventeen thousand dollars. It was a cluster. So now I choose the title company. You got your choices, you know, your, your big choice, lawyers title, Chicago title, Stewart title, all those. Stay away from shifting sands mutual. Trust me, stay away from those guys. Okay. So you're going to, if you've got to set up on your critical dates timeline, the dates on the title insurance program, the title insurance, um, the, the title insurance and title survey matters within the purchase and sale contract. You're going to have, you know, the, with it, you're going to get that letter from I'm get, getting going, jump, jumping ahead because I'm trying to get this all in in 30 to 45 minutes. But here goes. You're going to get a letter in the mail. Open up the mail. Title insurance commitment letter. Do not put it in your inbox. Get it to your local council as quickly as possible. Let them review it and let them do their job of getting rid of the exceptions to the commitment letter. So on every title commitment policy, you have the uh, section B1 and section B2. B1 are your standard exceptions. I don't know why they just don't write them as part of the policy. And part B2 are the exceptions that are unique to your property like all the liens that are on the property, all the easements that are on the property. They are going to put in exceptions to those to those policies, meaning like we'll cover your claim for a title claim, except if this happens. Uh, we'll cover you, except if it has something to do with the survey that you should have known about before you bought the policy. All these exceptions, they stick in there. And it's your lawyer's job is to get those exceptions kicked out. You want as clean a title policy as possible, and you want to get rid of those as best you can. Um, I've seen I've seen some uh, lawyers write title exception letters that are absolute magnificent works of art. And I've seen some lawyers say, well, we don't request they move remove any exceptions. We just take it as it is. Like, no, fire that attorney. Get yourself one that knows how to get those uh, exceptions removed from a title company. I'll tell you right now, uh, people are like, well, what can we hire you? No, no, you can't. I won't do it for you. I'll tell you what, who's good and who's not by looking at their work. But I'm not. I'm not going to practice live. I'm only licensed in Massachusetts. That's not what I do. Okay. So you're going to go through that process, and if they come back and they won't remove those exceptions, you've got a decision to make. You've got to sit back and say, Do I really want to buy this property? Can I get clear and marketable title when I go to sell the property so the next guy will be able to buy it with no problem? If you have a problem with that, don't buy the property. Kill the contract. Remember, this is part of the due diligence. Due diligence is to determine if it's a good deal or not. If you find out that there's a problem with the title and you can't clear, clear it up, don't buy the property. That's the first thing you got to think about when you're doing the due diligence, the, the legal due diligence component, okay? Now, you know, I bought property before with uh, issues to the title and I've, I've, you know, cleaned it up myself and I've, I've gone and I've... Um, uh, you know, gone to court to have the, uh, the, the title quieted. Uh, there's so many things you can do to solve the problems. But this is a time when you learn about it and you want to make the decision. Is this something that I want to do? Okay, so that's, that is, um, that's the legal due diligence component. Now, the second part, and remember, your fanny is still in the seat. You have not gotten in a plane and flown anywhere. It passes that muster. The next thing you do is the financial due diligence. Now, remember, right from the very first document you ever sent those people, the letter of intent, if you're if you're one of my students, you have the list of everything you need for the due diligence attached to that letter. You need all of that information. Or during the negotiation process, the seller came back and said, I can't give you that. I'm not going to give you that. That's none of your business. I don't own that. Well, if you get, if you, you finally execute the purchase and sale, 
whatever was on that list that hasn't been crossed out, you get to keep. Now, the way I've written my contracts is the effective date of the contract doesn't start until the all that those documents are in my possession. And if you don't have those documents and they're not, not in your possession, but you said you were going to give them to me in my, in my uh, purchase and sale contract, well, then shame on you. I don't have to put down any earnest money because the contract says. So always ha make sure, have those discussions, let the brokers know, hey, guys, I, I asked for it. They said they were going to give it to me. And why are you telling me now they can't give it to me? Um, but you're going to take all the financial information from that, uh, from that list and start rebuilding the financials of the property. You're going to create a trailing 12. You're going to create a new income and expense statement for that property. And you're going to verify every document, every number with a third party report. That's why one of the things you always, always have in that list uh, uh, from the original list is the a record of the last 12 months of deposits. You want to see the bank statements. Oh, I'm not going to give you my bank statements. So I, I mean, that's, I'm not going to do that. But pal, I'm buying a business here. I need to see how much money this business made over the last 12 months. I told you what it made. It made this. Yeah, I need to verify that with a third party, which would be your bank. Well, geez, you know, the, uh, that, that, um, I, okay, let's be honest. Okay, you know, I, I kind of run this thing like it's my own little ATM machine. So you're gonna see like money coming out. I said, listen, I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't care. All I care about is the money going in. That's what I want to verify with your bank statements. I, I just want to see the deposits. I don't care about the expenses. Just show me the deposits. I'll verify the expenses with everything else. But just show me the deposits and verify that you told me it made a million bucks. I want to see a million dollars going to the bank. If I only see a half a million dollars going to the bank, you didn't make a million bucks. And then this property is not what I think it is. Oh, well, um, you know, I own a bunch of properties. Kind of, I'm kind of huge here in this industry. And uh, I commingle the accounts. Okay. All right. Well, here's, here's what I'm going to need. I'm going to need the same data that you give to your accountant that he uses when he signs off on your tax return. That's the, that's the data I want because you, you may think that that excuse works for me, but it's not going to work for your accountant. So I want the same data that your accountant gets. Listen, that's, that's, you know, how tough you get because remember if you were buying a, a subway franchise, you'd get to see the bank deposits it wouldn't even be a question. If you buy any other business, you get to see the bank deposits. This is a business. You're buying a going business and you need to see the bank deposits. So what you're going to do is you're going to rebuild the financials for this property right from the top all the way down to the bottom. And that's what's going to tell you whether this deal is for real or not. Remember, up to this point, you have been dealing with broker data. You cannot get a loan on broker data. You can get a loan with all these other requirements that we put into the, into the list. Make sure you get those and take your time. Do it right. This is the second part of the inspection. Folks, I'm telling you right now, take your time, get this done right. If it doesn't pass muster, if it doesn't pass muster, then you're getting out of the deal and your fanny hasn't even left the seat yet. Okay. So oh, come on, hold on. All right. So that is, so that will take you the first two weeks of that 30 day period. You're in your home office going through the deal. That's it. If it can't pass, why are you jumping in a plane and flying out to see somebody? It's just not worth it. All right. Now, the, set, the final inspection, the final component of due diligence is the physical. This is when you are going to get out there with your team and, and you're going to take a look at the property. Now, 
you know, if you're new to this, you're going to really look underneath the skirt. You're going to you're going to do a deep dive. You're going to make sure that you that it is what you what you say it is. If you're getting to the big components, the 300 unit properties, I have a friend of mine, the guy I had on my on my uh, podcast a little while back, I think his name was Brian Burke. Um, he sits in his office. He he doesn't. He just sends somebody out there to do all that, and he, and he just deals with the numbers. And that's a that's a cool place to get. But remember, Brian, and you listen to him on my, on my podcast. He wasn't always that way. He was out there, you know, going through every single unit. And I recommend that you do the same early on because if anything, it's going to teach you what this business is really like. And if you're looking to be that guy like Brian, you better get out there and. Um, and uh, understand what it takes to be the boss. So that's why I listen to these people who are, you know, oh, I own a thousand units. I'm a, I'm a yeah, I'm passive investor, and I own a thousand units. And they've never once, they've never once had to walk a unit. They've never once had to go through the due diligence process. Somebody else is doing it for them. They've never once had to evict a, a tenant at the door with the sheriff next to him and a big cannon on on his hip, you know. Those guys are not in this business. They're just, you know, they're just playing like they are. I'm teaching you how to be in this business and what you need to do to be a success. So first couple rules is understand that you will go through every single unit. Uh, we don't have keys for those. Drill it out. Uh, we, we can't drill it out. Drill it out or this deal is done. I got 20, I gave you uh, plenty of notice. You gave all the tenants 24 hours. It says in the lease that they are not allowed to change the locks. And if they do change the locks, they're supposed to give you a key. They didn't give you a key, drill out the lock. And they drill it out and say, you know, put a sign up. It says, come down to the maintenance management office to get, you know, get your new key. Um, and you go in there and take a look at it. You will see every every unit. It's always the ones you can't see that cause the problem. I mean, I had a uh, I, you know it was one particular deal. It ended up going. It ended up being a lawsuit, um, and uh, it was a 24 unit down in Baltimore. And the guy wouldn't let the buyer, who was my client, uh, in to see six units. Never could get into to see those six units. And he killed the deal, but he killed the deal two days after the inspection period was over and tried to hang his hat on the financing component because he never got the financials. He never got into seeing everything. And I kept telling him, kill the deal, kill the deal, kill the deal. No, no, he's going to get me the numbers. He's going to get me the numbers. Nope, never did. So, uh, yeah, so we he ended up, the guy kept the uh, earnest money deposit and uh, they all hightailed it out and, you know, ended up being a lawsuit. It was, it was, it was bad. It was terrible. All right. But. You get out there, you're going to see every single unit, and you're going to start your due diligence process. Depending upon the quality of the asset, you're going to build, you're going to start your due diligence process five miles, three miles, one mile from the property. If it's an A class, high B plus, B plus, you're going to start five to three miles away from the property because those types of tenants, they live further afield uh, and from where they work. So you want to get a feel and a flavor for what that area is like that those people come home to every single night. B to C plus, you're in the three to one range. Solid C, those people live and work right on that street. So you want to start watching that terrain as you get closer to the property. That's when your due diligence starts. Look to see who your competition is. Check the flags, the marketing flags that they have out in, out in front of their, uh, their buildings. You know, for rent, free rent, you know, uh, first month's free, all that type of stuff. You want to get a real flavor for who your, who your competition is and what they're doing to uh, get the properties, um, uh, get the properties uh, marketed up. Uh, and then you're going to put, once you pull onto the property, you look at the monument sign, you look at the signage, you look at the curb appeal. How does it look? What does the curb look like? What do the, the parking lots look like? When was the last time they were paved? I mean, uh, 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 striped. You want to get a full feel of that particular uh, property as you drive up and you drive through it. The next thing, and probably the most important, and this, I, I, I can tell you, I get so many of my students come back to me years later and they say, Charlie, 
I remember when you told me that one thing and it didn't, it didn't hit me until I bought a property. And now I understand just how important what you taught was. And that is folks, if you learn one thing about any properties, this is it today. When you pull up to a property, always try to understand where the water goes. Think about it. Water can destroy anything. And it, and it has serious impacts on your property. So when you look at a property, start at the top. And I mean the whole compound, the whole complex. Start at the top and work your way all the way down to the lowest point. From the top, how do the roofs look? Are they on the are they 20th year? Are you going to have to replace the roofs? Or how do they look? Were they recently replaced? Make sure that the whole roof has been replaced. I bought one property. The guy replaced the front. Didn't bother with the back. Oy vey. That's a guy that's all about looks. Then the water comes down off the roof. It goes into the gutters. How do the gutters look? Is anyone trying to grow a garden in the gutters? Have they been cleaned out recently? Are they, are they attached uh, correctly to the building? All the gutters. What are the downspouts like? Are they all attached? Are they all attached to the building? Are they attached to the top gutter? Or do they come down the sides safely and, and, and uh, without any, they're dangling? When they hit the bottom, what do they hit? Are they being pulled away from the building? Remember, that's the purpose of gutters is to pull water away from the building. And is that happening? Then what's the topography of the land? Where once it hits that down there, and, and or even if it doesn't hit the hit the building, it slopes down into the parking lot. How does the parking lot look? What are the what are the um the curb cuts? What are the uh, the sewer caps look like? Uh, are they are they falling apart? I'm telling you guys, I had to have one sewer cut uh, fi sewer cap fixed in one of my properties. I had three three paving companies come in to give me an estimate on it. I think these guys have breakfast together. <clears throat> all, all the same number, $25,000 to have a new a new curb cut put in, a new sewer cap put in. Couldn't believe it. $25,000, each one of them. Like no one's trying to outdo the other guy. Uh. And then also when it gets to the topography, look at look at the any buildings higher than other buildings. And that's the problem that this one student that uh, recently told me that had. He said, um, he said, you know, uh, I, I had this one building that, you know, you walk in, like some of the tenants walk in on the second floor from the parking lot. And then other tenants would have to park around back on the other parking lot and walk in to the first floor from their parking lot. And so in that regard, oh boy, look at everybody wants me today. Um, in that regard, when it rained, the water would slope down the, down to the first floor and it would pool on the first floor and it would fill up their units. And man, sometimes when you're walking these units, this is what I learned. I, my wife taught me the, the smells. Um, I didn't know what mold smells like. I know what mold smells like now. Uh, and I can tell you, that's the thing you, especially when you go start walking into a unit to do the inspection on the unit, I can stand at the door, take one look around and say, okay, next and walk in because all I'm looking for is water damage. You know, is, does it smell moldy in there? When you walk into the first floor of those types of properties, you can smell the mold, uh, without fail. It's amazing. Um, so though that's, that's what happens when you drive up to the property, look to ask yourself the question, where does the water go? Then you're going to get, you know, you really have two jobs to do when you get on that property. You have need to have a team that goes through the physical inspection of every single unit. And then you have to have the most important job done, which is not that that's not the most important job. How many people think they know what the most important job is? The most important job when you set foot on that property, who's got the most important job? 
I'm going to wait for answers in the comment section. I'm going to tell you a story about one time when I was looking at, we were trying to do about a 3,000 unit portfolio. And now we were looking at, uh, I was doing one of the complexes with a, with a, a property management company, a guy from the property management company. He took one side, I took the other. And our job was before lunch would do half, after lunch would do the other half. And that's how we're going to break it up. So I go through the whole process. I go through the, my, my first quarter of the, of the complex in the morning. We meet at lunch at the, at the um, management office, sit down and have lunch. And he says, wow, can you believe all the cucarachas? For those of you not, in, not hip to property management, that's Texan for cockroaches. And I said, wow, I didn't, I didn't see any. I, you know, they, they weren't you know, on my property. I don't know where you were looking. Maybe you got a bad, bad bunch of units. He goes, where do you look? I said, well, I, I go in wherever water is. I go and I look under the under the, the sink, around the toilet, around the tub, wherever there's water. I don't see any cucarachas. He goes, no, that's not where they go. I said, where do they go? He goes, above the door sill and above the window sill they hang out there and he says when you walk into the room and you turn on the light switch they scatter you can see them just scatter and i was like wow oh okay i'll 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 watch for that i'll check for that the next time i saw the guy when we were done i said I could not believe how many cockroaches I saw in the afternoon. That was disgusting. He goes, yep, yep, you saw them, you saw them. And he was right. They were exactly where he said. And every time I went and did an inspection after that, that's where I looked. And I was never disappointed. And that, you know, when you know a property is struggling, is when you look at the, their trailing 12 financial statement and you have no expense for pest control. That's the first thing that gets cut. And you know it. You know it when you see that those those things are not reined in. It's like, oh, yeah, well, we, we cut pest control. We don't, we don't have any pests on this property. Liar. Every apartment building has, has a pest problem, pest control problem. All right, so no one's chiming in. No one's going to give me the answer. But the most important aspect, the most important job when you go to do the physical due diligence is not walking the units. Anything that is wrong with that property can be fixed with a finite amount of money. The most important job when you go on property is sitting in the office and going through every single lease file. You want to see everything. You want to see the renewals. You want to see the updated uh, credit and criminal background checks. You want to make sure they did a criminal background check. You want to make sure that when the, the person goes out who's doing the physical inspection, they get a rent roll and they go in there and the rent roll says, Wow, oh, there's no no pet in this in this unit, so that's they're not collecting a pet fee. And you walk in there and you see a big dog. Red flag. Write that one down. Or you walk into the into the unit, and you see mattresses laid out all over the floors, because they're all a bunch of migrant workers coming in and sleeping all different hours, coming and going, and they just have a place to stay. The lease does not allow for that. Not only does the lease not allow for that, the Board of Health doesn't allow for that either. And the killer on that thing is those guys use a lot of water. And they use a lot more water than you budgeted for two people with uh, per bedroom. So that's another red flag problem. So you want to make sure that the rent, the rent roll matches up with what the lease says. So when you're done the physical inspection, you come back to the person and say, ah, these are suspicious right here. You might want to check this I know. See what it says in the lease about pets. Do they have? Do they sign the pet waiver? Do they sign the, um, you know, all the all the other documentation for the for the pets, uh, or not? Um, so those are the types of things you want to make sure the actual physical um, phys physical location matches up with the what the, it says on the on the lease. You want to make sure that 
you see all the renewals. You want to make sure that the numbers on the lease match up with the numbers that you've been told. Remember, the lease is the controlling document. If the rent on the lease says 800, but the rent roll says 850, which is right? Rent roll is junk in, junk out. Lease is a physical, legal contract for services. That's what, what's, what's controlling. Security deposit, lease, no security deposit or, or 800, rent roll, zero. You better collect 800 bucks from that, that landlord when you take over that property because you're going to owe it if you don't. Because the lease says 800, that's what you have to get. So you really want to make sure. And then, of course, you're going to look for, for oh, I'll tell you this one final story. And then, I, then we got to call it quits. Final story. One of the worst deals I ever did, ever did. It was an assumption, which was another problem with it. Um, but here's the thing. The, the property... We wanted certified rent rolls every month. Owner said, no problem. My property management company will get it to you every single month. We were under contract go, trying to get the assumption done five months. For five months, this pro property was, was, was under contract. It was a disaster. You just kept, you know, um, you just kept uh, getting a new thing from the bank and a new thing from the bank and a new thing from the bank. And so finally... Um, Finally, uh, we took over the property and they had certified 95% occupancy for all five months. And I got to tell you guys, I looked at these numbers and I thought, damn, this thing's going to be a cash cow. This thing is awesome. So great. 30 days in, I'm calling the property, my, my property management company saying, hey, What's the deal here? Uh, there's a uh, you only collected 40 per, 50 percent of the money this month. He goes, Charlie, we collected all the money this month. I go, no, you don't. I, I got I'm supposed to be getting a hundred thousand dollars on this property. You guys picked up 55,000, Charlie. We picked up rent from everyone that's here, and not one moving van has pulled up. I said, Are you telling me that? It's 55% occupied and not 95%. The guy says, Charlie, this is the biggest case of fraud I've ever seen in my life. I said, well, come on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't just accuse somebody of fraud. You got to have, yeah, they have to have proof. And they said, we got proof. I said, what's your proof? I said, Charlie, look at these leases. Now look at the leases. Yeah, okay, fine. He says, look at these eight leases. Okay. Yeah. All right. He goes, all of these leases are whited out in the exact same spot. Okay, I, okay, what does that mean? He goes, they whited it out. They whited out the name of the property, and they white, whited out the unit number, and they whited out the, the name of the tenant. And they wrote in the new tenant. I said, okay, all right. He goes, now look at this lease. You see, on this lease, they forgot to white out the property name. I said, all right, so what's that Polo Run AV? What is that property? Oh, that's the other property that the landlord, that the owner owns down the street. He was taking leases out of that and sticking them in here and telling you it was 95% occupied. I'm not going to tell you the punchline of the story. It's it didn't it didn't end well with one of those deals you wish you'd never seen or, or heard from again. So um, that's why sitting in that management office, that's where the money comes from. Remember, nothing happens in this business until someone signs a lease. That's the first time money starts to move in this business. So make sure those leases are good, are excellent. All right. That is it. That's 
all I got for you. And if you're in my hotel to apartment, uh, Chicago cohort, I will see you in 15 minutes. Um, we got some, some awesome stuff to talk about. We are in business. That business is cranking, absolutely cranking. And, um, uh, we got a lot to go over today at four o'clock. I hope this was helpful. Anybody, if you have any questions, go ahead and chime on in. Did you, did you get your investment back from the fraud case? Francis, no, we lost everything. It was a disaster. Um, okay, everybody, great to see you all. Hope this was helpful. I'll see it. Oh, I may be off for a couple of weeks. Stay tuned. I'll let you know. But watch, watch for any updates. Good to see you all, and I'll chat with you later.